I like the theory of it. I'm just uh, unclear about how to be as clean about it as we'd like to be. I, I, I like the idea of limiting how many packs they can create. And, I, and I, it doesn't bother me that that would limit franchises or subsidiaries. I mean, Anthony, what are you, I mean, this is your baby. What are you thinking? The less the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah, I mean, that's generally what I would say. It just, this question of, like, when you're talking about subsidiaries, I think of it more as these regional groups. I'm not so sure about limiting them. Maybe I don't feel that strongly, and that's why I'm not being clear about it. Will, do we have any, or Paul or Dan or anybody, do we have any examples of, of corporations that, you know, that are on our radar screens of, of an example of the misuse of this? Well, it isn't a lie yet. Well, or an example of a corporation uh, creating more than one pack that, you know, or a group. I mean, do we have examples of anything that's been sort of stuck out or egregious or has bothered, has risen to the top and been here? Okay. Under, under our Vermont system and, and the Vermont registrations, it's pretty rare that a single entity registers more than one pack. Rare, but not impossible. I can't think of an example off the top of my head if that gives you an indication of how rare. So if you and have I'm searching through the registrants from the 2018 cycle right now that you can Thank you. search on our website, and I'm not finding any. Uh, but of course, you, they, there is no particular incentive to right. do that now because there isn't a restriction right. on corporate giving in the way that would be right. in place under right. this law. Yeah. So it's not surprising that you wouldn't find that now. There are examples of where uh, individuals have been giving through a number of different corporate entities. Um, your former colleague, Senator Galbraith, used to speak uh, uh, a lot about the idea that people could create an uh, innumerable number of LLCs and so forth. And I don't, well, I don't know how many examples, but certainly there are examples that one could find where people have um, given or kind of related corporations have all given uh, to a certain candidate, for instance. But it costs money to set up LLCs. I mean, it's not an insubstantial thing to create LLCs. To, to do an LLC? No. Are you kidding? It's effort, it's time, and it's some money, right? Not but not much. My husband set up his LLP for um, $20 registration fee at the Secretary of State's office. That's what it cost him. So, so this is a, I, was, I was just mentioning that as a point of fact, excuse me, Senator. No, it's um, related to the language you guys are looking at right now. I always come to you with the perspective of can I answer questions about it from the people who right. are regulated by it. I don't have an issue with, with that particular list of kinds of subsidiaries that's in there. And my answer to anybody asserting that they weren't one of those would be that it's up to them to make that argument when somebody challenges them on that basis. I think most of them will look at that list and acknowledge that they are one of those things, or it will be clear that they aren't. Yeah. And I think Paul's point is a good one, which is this this will, our limitation in other areas, it's like the balloon, it'll push it into, in, in, it will make this more, possibly more relevant because uh, when you're limited in one capacity, you often try and find ways that you aren't limited, obviously, and this would then be, help keep that a little more consistent without allowing it to pop up in, in greater numbers elsewhere. So I have enough issues with this, this section. I don't have any issues with the other two. I have enough issues with this that what I would say is, what my feeling is, if, if the corporation or the public interest group or the labor organization has to have their name in the pack, 
they in the when this takes effect and we see that beeper has now set up 23 packs or that exxon mobil has set up 23 packs we can revisit it good Th point. that is you that can always do that I, I just have enough concerns about it right now that I don't I would not feel comfortable um, defending this. That's Anthony, what do you think? I could go with that. You what? I could go with what you just said. Oh. Me too. Yeah, me too. So we should be able to get um, a clean copy of the original with your um, <laughs> the First Amendment there about the um, the name. Yes. Yes. Hello, Mr. Pro Tem. Might I chat with you for a moment? The in great private name or is. just right here? Which oh, you mean? Oh, like out here. Oh, that means in private. So, so, my, so my, can I just one second first? Is we have this, um, I believe we are dealing with this until three o'clock. Is it possible to have it a clean copy and we can vote on it before three? Well, yes, we'll get him. He's, would you prefer him straight off format? Uh, whichever is easier. We've heard that in some instances, uh, because of workload, that it's easier to do an amendment, but uh, whatever is easier for you. Okay. Okay. I prefer strike all, but I on on this one, I don't care. Okay. All right. So Just two seconds. Yes. So we'll do that. We'll take a break right now. Okay. For 15 minutes. Sounds good. Language and um, you know, even though we can be proud that Vermont was one of the first to to set limits on indentured servitude and to prohibit slavery. Um, still, I think for some people, uh, you know, and I, I can't necessarily personally relate because um, I'm, you know, not a person of color. I don't have ancestors who, you know, had to deal with, with any of this. Um, but I think for some, some people, it really it's a, it's triggers very difficult uh, ideas. And I just really think we need to be as plain and uh, straightforward as possible. Yes. So, you know, my committee knows that, you know, if I, if, I, if I was able to do this just on my own, which I'm not, probably a good thing, uh, we'd end it with just after therefore slavery in any form is prohibited because I think the objective of this, and I think it dovetails to what your objective is, our objective is to clarify for the public and there and people were even though Peter Tichow has helped illuminate the, the misconception that people I think were under um, and the, the the language is misconstrued uh, and I think our objective in changing this amendment is to clarify for for the general population and uh, I think that clarifies it um, I, I'd like uh, in my you less is more, but we we have discussed this at great length, and there are you know there are and and other concerns about legally what you're beholden to do or not beholden to do for jury duty or for debts or for mortgages or for whatever else you're required to pay or covered in other statutes. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna you know if we're gonna do a nod to uh, current understanding. We can also embrace the fact that most of what is covered elsewhere is covered in current in, under under our statutes in other areas. Mm -hmm. So I I think less is more, but I um, uh, so we, we, you know that's what we've been back and forth between because mm -hmm. that's yeah. what VLCT asked for is also the ending after probate. Yes, yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with you, Jennifer. I actually I actually support this language. Mm -hmm. And I support it because I think that it is, it is really important to acknowledge that when the founders did this, they were saying no person born in this country or brought from any place else 
ought to be beholden, except by their own consent, mm -hmm. to be a servant, and they said slave or apprentice. Now I'm not, we removed slave because I think that that little trio made it very complicated there because you really can't consent to be a slave. But you can consent to be a servant or an apprentice. People do it all the time. But you could be hired. Well, you can consent to being yeah. a servant or an apprentice. That primarily, that's the way you get to be a servant or an apprentice is by your consent. And I do like the or bond by law for the payment of debts, damages. I mean, that's. It seems to me that there is some historic value there, and. People are bound by law for uh, payment of debts, damages, fine. We have people in, in jail right now who are serving out sentences for some of these things. So I, I, I do like this language. Um, I, you know, we're a committee of five, and we'll make that decision. Some of us felt that we really didn't even need to do anything because slavery is already, because slavery is already prohibited under the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And the, by the, what we learned, which is really hard to tell people, is that by putting that age in there, and it used to be the age of 18 for women and um, 21 for men, and that by putting that in there, it wasn't referring necessarily to slavery, but was referring to indentured servitude. <coughs> and in most states, 30 was the age. And so we were being really progressive here mm -hmm. in saying you're free at 18 or you're free at 21 instead of waiting till 30. Mm -hmm. So, but that's hard to explain right. to people. So uh, there were, um, I mean, we had a debate about whether we should even do anything mm -hmm. and just leave it the way it was because um, historically, I mean, we are the first, we were the first state to prohibit slavery. And if we just have that first part, it's just using exactly what was in the Pennsylvania Constitution. Mm -hmm. It isn't unique to Vermont at all. It's just taken directly from the Pennsylvania Constitution and then we added the part about slavery. So, yeah. Yeah. Brian, did you yeah. want to? Yeah, I, I think as the chair mentioned, if you take the three people who have so far spoken, um, you'll find three views on this. <laughs> Mine is um, in concert with uh, Senator McCormick's, and I, I was swayed very much by his argument that we just leave things alone and don't change it. And I still am. Because I think, as he put it, it does provide a useful and instructive learning opportunity for people to look at it, measure progress against the, the way things are today, and constantly have that as a frame of reference. So we. <laughs> We're, Allison we're is kind of on, <laughs> as on one side, yes. and, and our Senator White is in the middle, and I'm on the other side. No. And I don't know where we're going to go. I would say, I think two things. So, there's a balance, we're trying to find a balance between being clear, but not necessarily eliminating all the words of the people who wrote the Constitution, because there's some historical significance in the things that they said, some of which was not good, obviously. I'm not, not, not denying that. But I think the main idea behind this effort is to make it clear that slavery is prohibited and has, is and has been prohibited in Vermont. And in the purpose, it says the proposal would amend the Constitution to clarify that slavery in any form is prohibited. And you go down to line 12, and it says all persons born free their natural rights, slavery prohibited. So it says it twice. And then line 16, it says, therefore, slavery in any form is prohibited. So I, I, mean, I understand where you're coming from, Senator Ingram. And I'm, I'm willing, I'm not, not thinking it through. I'm just saying, though, that when I look at it, it seems pretty clear to me that it's prohibiting slavery because it says it in, the, in very definitive terms three times within seven lines. So I'm not close to what you're saying. I'm just putting out another point of view. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, I um, But I, you know, I, I think that there are some things that you know, we can teach in our history classes and our, put in our history books and other things that, you know, I mean, the Constitution is not meant to necessarily teach people history. It's meant to be the expression of our current values and thoughts and the way we look at, at the law. And um, that's, you know, I think that people are kind of interpreting that this is, is it's a living document. And so it, it's appropriate to make those changes 
and to teach the history separately in, you know, in history class and in our history books. I agree with that. I also agree that saying it in this manner does make it clear mm -hmm. and does reflect our current values because it does say that you can't be beholden unless by your own consent. That makes it very clear that that is our current value in my mind. And 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 I, I I'm not gonna we're not gonna discuss this anymore now because we're gonna move into the next sure. thing. But so we could. The, the Constitution is a framework of our values mm -hmm. and what we believe. The, how we actually operate and um, what we actually do is not always consistent with our, the framework and what we believe. So we know that we weren't being consistent. Um, just so. one quick final thing. <laughs> So you know, an interesting thing that I learned as we've been working through this process is that Article 36 um, in the Constitution under Articles of Amendment, dated 1913, uh, directs the judges to uh, the Supreme Court to revise the Constitution to bring it up to date so that it expresses sort of current beliefs and, and as opposed to how we handle the U.S. Constitution when we leave it alone, and then we keep adding amendments. So you can see the earlier version, three-fifths of a person, for instance, and enumerating, and then you see the 13th Amendment come along later. And um, so I'm a little torn, and part of me just says, well, if we stuck with the process laid out in 1913, we would say, say contemporize it, and that would include um, eliminating that section that we've been editing. On the other hand, you could say, if it has value, you know, and so I would say, we're part of the wrestling match is to say, do we keep historical references in there, I don't know what to say, as a, as a, for some people as a point of pride to have been the first state to have had a, in, you know, albeit potentially a complete prohibition or problematically expressed prohibition. Mm -hmm. I honestly am torn between the two camps. Well, I'm going to, as I'll chair, I'm going to take my prerogative and have the last word on this, and then we're going to move. And I would say that it is a living document, and it should reflect our current values. And this language does reflect our current values, because it says, no one brought, born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be beholden by law to serve any person as a servant or apprentice. I don't think that any of us would argue that that's a value that we have, nor, or bound by law, unless bound by the person's own consent, or bound by law to the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, and the like. I don't know that anybody would, or I certainly don't say that that isn't a value of ours. I, it, it, to me, it does reflect our current values. It doesn't always reflect our current practices, but it does reflect our current values in my mind. So, as the chair's prerogative, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot. And if I may, um, thank you. Uh, ask some people to testify then on Thursday. That would be okay. And get in touch with Gail. Yeah, and and if they have, just because we only <coughs> have a certain amount of time, right. if they have different perspectives or different points of view. Um, and, and I will again say that it's not a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. So if 20 people come in and say <coughs> the, same, the thing. same thing, that's because we have. And, and um, I, I do feel a little bit that we've had this on the agenda for a long time, and nobody has asked to come in and testify. So um, I'm a little concerned now that people are Upset that we're going too fast. No, so I think it wasn't on people's radar. But no, I, I understand. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, See you later. Back. Okay. Back. All right. So, committee, we're going to go to um, S47. As you could tell, what bill we're dealing with by looking at in the wrong. So, I think that. Um, <coughs> When we did S-47, we had two, three decisions to make. Am I right here? We had three decisions to make. Do, do we like the language that's there now? Do we want to address how, putting uh, the name, requiring 
whoever sets up a pack to have the name, their name in the pack, and what would that mean? And do we want to limit the number of packs? Any corporation? Well, anybody it would have to be anybody. The number of packs anybody, I would think, could to could form a corporation, a union, a labor union, a um. That's so. Those are. Am I? Do I remember right? Are those are three questions? Those are the three that are left. Okay, so let's take the first one first. Did, did we? Um, is Eleanor coming? Do we? I don't know. Anyway, do we have? Um, uh, are there issues with the um, the first one about the definition of the the person, the individual? Yeah, it's our purpose. The only draft I have is 1.1. 1. 1. So that's part of right. And then right. I have Betsy Ann's uh, memo of yesterday. Yeah. The overview of potential SGO amendment right. to S41. Right. But first, what I want to do is this is, Oops. is the underlying question was do you have that in here, Betsy? Do you want to join yes. us? Sure. Um, Okay. Senator, would you like me to post these documents or would you like to go through them first? Yeah, you can post them. Okay. Um, the one that says draft not yet edited from two to Right, that's okay. 19. That's the one. Right. And yeah. Then, and then Betsy Ann <coughs> did a, right. a memo to us yesterday. Right. Um, and we're looking at, I guess, section 1A, which adds the fact definition. Okay, Betsy, do you want to, um, yeah. Hello, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Pursuant to your request, I drafted draft amendment 1.1. 1 .1. It's labeled with yesterday's date with the noon time stamp. Um, Madam Chair, as you already described, mm -hmm. what this amendment overall would do would um, first, acknowledge that PACs that don't reach current laws, a thousand dollar spending or contribution threshold can form a PAC before they reach that threshold. Our current law just says once you reach a thousand dollars of spending um, and uh, contributions that you are a PAC. So the first part of this amendment is just saying and you can also register as a PAC prior reaching that threshold. So for example, if S-47 were enacted and a corporation wanted to make a $500 contribution to a candidate, this bill would prohibit the corporation from doing so directly. It would need to establish a PAC to do so. So the language on the first page allows entities to form PACs before they reach the $1,000 threshold. <coughs> okay, okay let's, we'll go through them all first. Okay. Um, on page two, what's happening is the idea that you had discussed the other day that a PAC would need to include in its name and state in its PAC registration form with the Secretary of State's office the full name of its connected organization, which is a defined term in this amendment, or any commonly known abbreviation um, by which it's known. So for example, if Corporation XYZ wanted to start a PAC it would have to include the name Corporation XYZ in the PAC name. Um, I included in your overview that this is similar to what's required in federal law. And I provided the federal law sites um, where currently uh, a PAC under federal law, um, PAC registration and name has to include the name of its connected organization. And that would go for anything, not just the corporation, but any Anybody who wants to form a PAC, if the uh, trade association or or a union, yes, or um, the Methodist Church, yes, yes. Okay. Um, the Secretary of State's office did point out to me that maybe you would want to add here, if applicable, in case there's not a connected organization that is establishing mm -hmm. a PAC. Yeah. So that's one yeah. um, potential amendment that I have here, and we can come back to that issue. For example, if it's a group of neighbors that want to start a PAC. Um, another 
thing that was happening is on your last page, on page four, which is a small sentence, page four, lines three and four, but it would prohibit a connected organization from registering more than one PAC. That makes contributions. Um, so that inclusion of the phrase, that makes contributions as noted in your overview, I'm on page four, lines three and four. There are lines 59, 61, 60. Yeah, the line numbers just keep on going. Ours say 68 in the head. <laughs> it's exciting. It's put us on our toes. <laughs> it means we're all awake. Uh, all it's right. line 68 and 69. Pardon me. Thank no, you. Okay. I guess it's because I send it not as a PDF and as a Word doc. So, so there must have been some weird format. Right. Right. So are you a number? Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. We're on line 68 and 69. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. The language is a connected organization is prohibited from registering more than one political committee that makes contributions. Yep. Um, that phrase, as I noted in the overview, that makes contributions is designed to help avoid any unconstitutional speech implications. So it doesn't apply to IE only PACs, super PACs, which don't make contributions. Yep. I noted that that provision on page two of your overview is similar to what happens in Connecticut's law, um, which prohibits business entities from establishing more than one PAC. And it's also similar to what happens in federal law, because federal law says if you're a subsidiary of a connected organization, um, all of the connected organizations, subsidiaries, divisions, parents, etc., all of their contributions are affiliated and relate back to that one connected organization. So in a way, it has somewhat of a similar effect that there's limits on contributions from that one connected organization. Because all the contributions relate back to that one connected organization and therefore relate to that overall contribution limit. That's so, the if you, so if you had Exxon Corporation, Exxon Corporation, but then you had um, 70, 17 um, dealer, Exxon dealers, in Vermont, they the the whole shebang could only have one pack. Is that what this is saying? This language in your amendment is saying that yes, as it's defining a connected organization, because connected organization down below that prohibition includes any organizational parent, subsidiary, branch, division, department, or local unit thereof. Um, I base that on the federal law, how the federal law is administered in practice. I'm not 100% certain, but it's based on the same concept that it all relates back to the parent organization. So if you have the Vermont NEA, they formed a PAC. You couldn't have the Wyndham County chapter form a PAC. The NEA. Yes, that's how I would read that. They couldn't. Okay. And, uh, Got it. Okay. Just definitely should hear from the yeah. Indian Secretary of State's office on how they read that to make yeah. sure it's clear for how they need to administer and execute the law. Because on your memo, the last part of your memo, subdivision two, it says it's meant to clarify the members of a connected organization, etc. That seems to say that if the if the um, chemical producers of America, which includes Monsanto, has a pack, it doesn't stop Monsanto from having its own pack. That subdivision two, so if, the, if the, that, that subdivision two at the end is relating to membership organizations, like trade associations, where different businesses are, for example, membership. So of if the, the Realtors Association has a PAC, yes. would it stop Polina Realty from having a PAC no. also? No, it would not stop it. Yeah. Why? Because it's, it's a, a trade organization. organization. Okay. So separate entities. Right. Yeah. So if a person, Bray Construction and Bray Plumbing, owned by the same person, could either of those or both of those businesses form a pack? Those sound like two different businesses to me. Well, they would be registered separately, yeah. I would assume. So I'm just thinking of yeah. what we want to capture and what we yeah. don't. Right. Okay. So you decided, well, are we talking about it now or are we going through it? I, I don't well, know. I, what I'd like to... I don't want to get us off track. Yeah, what I want to do is make sure that we get through the, so that we understand what's in here before we start debating. Okay. But I 
I don't see in your draft the original. Oh, this would just add on to it. That's okay. Right. It's not a strike off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was saying, what has she done? So I just want to throw all that off the window. <laughs> okay. So our three decisions then, and we'll hear some testimony on this, are number one, a person, Betsy's person here, uh, individual. Individual. Um, the number, if they can do more than one, and whether their name should be in. Those are our three mm -hmm. decision points, right? Right. Okay. So, um, do, do, do we have any more questions for Betsy? Uh, um, ex just explanations. No, I just have uh, information about the Connecticut that did oh. this. You mean can, you have information or you want information from I'm her? just curious if we, so the objective I think of doing all this is to try and get the conception, the, the, the perception, the perception, thank you, that's really, the misconception, conception, thinking of all these bills we're dealing with in this building, um, the, the perception of, of influence, we're trying to get at eradicating the, or getting producing the impact of influence through corporate giving on an individual candidate uh, or an organization and I guess my question is in the places that have done it like Connecticut they've, they've done one of these do we see less money being spent do we see less influence being trying to be exerted I mean what are the results that we've seen so far of corporate of bills that have been designed to limit corporate influence? I don't have that information. I think you have to take testimony from other places that have these prohibitions. So I don't know for sure. I don't have that subjective knowledge. Because it it just well, <coughs> I just wish I felt I mean and I'd love to, to, to be effective. I just I, I and maybe somebody has information about the Connecticut choice. Well here yeah. that's done. If anybody does? Yeah. And I don't think it's about limiting the amount of money because we can't do that. It's about influence. That's, uh, yeah. It's, it's not about limiting the amount of money. I didn't say that. Oh, I thought you did. Okay. Um, any questions for Betsy about the? Okay. All right. So, who wants who wants to testify first? Who wants to come up? Xander. <laughs> I'd love to. Dan, Paul, Josh. Josh. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I was on it, uh, I'm asking Dan or Paul first. Um, thank you for the record. Uh, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPER. Um, we have. Um, earlier expressed support for this underlying legislation, so appreciate the committee's um, interest in it and your investigation into some of these uh, proposed amendments as well. Um, I would say for the record that um, in the last biennium, we uh, asked, uh, sent a, uh, an email out to our members and asked if they were interested in this issue of banning corporate contributions to candidates. And, uh, and we would be happy to submit electronically for the record the names of more than 700 Vermonters who uh, took the opportunity to respond in a positive way to that, to sign on to a petition saying that they supported, I, I believe the bill was S120 last uh, biennium. And as you know, that bill was essentially the same as the bill that you were initially taking up uh, this year. And the, the petition itself was pretty general. It was just about the question of whether you um, supported the idea of prohibiting corporations from giving money in the same way that you know human beings can give money to candidates. So that is um, a demonstration of public interest and public support, I think, for this idea uh, that you have before you. As I said, I'd be happy to submit that um, electronically for the record. Um, as it relates to the uh, proposed amendments that Betsy Ann was, was uh, walking through, we have also testified in the past in favor of the idea of limiting the number of uh, 
political committees that an entity could create so that you're not, uh, so that you're trying to address the, the potential for a corporation or another entity to circumvent the restrictions that you're, that you're otherwise trying to put in place here. So if a single corporation, for instance, could create 10 different uh, political committees, that is an invitation, it seems to us, um, to, to work around uh, the other uh, restrictions that you're putting in, place, putting in place as a matter of public policy. So we think it makes sense um, as long as you have the legal ability to do so, and it seems that because others have already taken this action, uh, that, uh, that that path is open to you. We similarly think that it makes sense um, to require the name of uh, whatever the term of art was that, that Betsy Ann used, uh, uh, but, the, but the affiliated entity should be part of the pack as well. And that's just a matter of transparency so that uh, people have some better idea about uh, who is funding that political action committee. I, I, I can't imagine much of an argument against that. So, uh, you know, we think that that makes sense. I should add that uh, your counterparts in the House were considering some of those issues um, when the bill uh, arrived over to them in the last legislative biennium. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that that would help to address some of the concerns that were being raised in the House uh, Government Operations Committee. So we would be supportive of that. Uh, Senator Clark, to your question, I don't come here today with information about how uh, in Connecticut, you know, whether there has been any um, identifiable reduction in influence um, or, or certainly any reduction in dollars uh, spent overall by affected entities, be they corporations uh, or otherwise. Um, but, but we do know, again, that simply by doing this, you're at least closing off one possibility for uh, entities to, again, circumvent the restrictions that you're otherwise, we otherwise have an existing law or that you would put into law um, through this uh, proposal. So that is to say, a single individual who may control multiple corporations couldn't give then as an individual and then as a corporation or as multiple corporation maxing out um, multiple times. And so that, that just is the case now in, in Connecticut at least that you don't, that you have closed the door to that type of um, circumvention, I guess you could say, of, uh, of the campaign finance laws. Um, so it's not, perfect uh, in that it doesn't address every aspect of undue influence in our elections. Um, we, you, uh, but we all as a public policy matter are limited uh, in some ways um, by uh, what the Supreme Court has said. Um, and uh, so, we, so we try to do what we can, I think, to limit undue influence in the ways that are available to us and certainly um, this seems like a sensible one that uh, 22 states and the federal government have, have been doing for uh, over a century for, mo for the most part, and uh, we think it's, uh, it does make sense with the proposed amendments that you're considering now. Okay. Any questions for Paul? Nope. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, did you want to justify us or did you say what you want to say? Put it great. Very eloquent. Do you want to testify? No. Um, Will? No? Josh? I think he actually said it. everything I would have said as well. Okay. Um, so, can we make some uh, decisions? Let's take the first one first. The original underlying bill. Uh, the I, the not prohibiting corporations, but identifying that only an individual or a political party or a PAC can donate to a candidate or a political party. It doesn't prohibit corporations. I mean, it does, in, but backwards. It does, we, because it was so hard to, to define corporations. So this does it in that way. Just a process question? Yes. Did you want to address the amendments first and then the underlying bill, or do you want no, to? No, I want to, there are three issues. Okay. The first, what I'd like to do is tick them off. Okay. And I, I don't care which direction we do it, but the, 
the one issue is the way we've defined uh, that only individuals in the original bill that we defined the way we defined that. The second issue is do we limit the number or do we require a name associated with the PAC, the name of the organization? And the third issue is do we limit the number? Those are, I think, are the three decisions that we have to make. And I just thought that since we'd had the most conversation about the underlying one, that we might be able to d make a decision on that first. So I would move that we accept the, the original page one through four of the original bill is introduced. I have to admit, I'm a little confused okay. on this first one. I'm beginning to the uh, second two, but okay, I'm, let me, I'm okay. less clear on okay. what. Let me explain then. The original bill said that only an individual, a political party, or a PAC could contribute directly to a candidate or a political party. That's the, that's the right. underlying. That was what we had, yeah. and that's what we're voting on now. So it, in essence, prohibits corporations labor unions, right. um, trade associations, um, LLCs, LLC, well, they're corporations, yeah. every, every type of corporation. Any labor union, any trade association, any church, any nonprofit, uh, if they're not already prohibited. It, uh, it, that, this is what we passed last year. Right. I'm just trying to reconcile definitions and defin. I mean, I'm just trying to, to, to figure out: Are we working from the bill no, as introduced no, or the oh, draft? Okay. I'm just no. Okay. Like section okay. one is like totally no. different. No. no. I'm section. Sorry. The, we are. If you take the original bill. Okay. Take the original bill as introduced. Right. Yes. That is what we're dealing with right now. Okay. That is, that is where the underlying language is about the definition of individuals and corporations. Right. It is not in the draft right. amendment that Betsy that's, gave us because it's in the underlying language. So that, that, that's why I'm lost. Okay. So those are our three issues. And the first issue that I've asked us to address is this issue of defining that only individuals, PACs, and political parties can can contribute to political parties or candidates directly. That's what that, that's what the original bill did. Okay, Anthony has made a motion. motion. Can, can we just have a show of hands on that? In favor of that. Okay, all right, so we, Done that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the second issue is the name. Do we want to suggest that, or do we want to suggest? <laughs> we suggest by this law that you do this. Actually, we did. There was a bill at one point that suggested that people do something. Oh, I know. It was name tags for lobbyists. Which you notice know, they've all started to do even. Wow. The um, so, do we want to require a name associate the name of the uh, underlying uh, entity that is forming the PAC? Do we want to require that they have their name associated with the PAC? And I don't know if this means they'd have to have it um, in all of their publications or if they just have to have it registered with the Secretary of State. Or embedded in the name itself, I thought. Well, I mean, they could have uh, fam Vermonters for Happy Families, which could be a, a pack of Veeper or it could be a pack of Vermont Yankee. So you say Vermont Yankee, Vermonters for Happy Families, but in so that's the way it's registered with the Secretary of State. Would it be required in all of their um, all their publications and everything, Betsy? 
Uh, yes, it would be required. Okay. The PAC name itself would be required to include the name of its connected organization <laughs> or its abbreviation or acronym. And for example, this would apply if such a PAC um, issued an electioneering communication because you have to have that identification information in there, electioneering communications, the paid for by. Yeah. So if it was um, Corporation XYZ's PAC, it would say paid for by Corporation XYZ PAC for happy families, right. or they want to name themselves. Okay. Okay. So, I would move that we accept that uh, amendment. Can I, I just have a question? Would it also have to include the name of anybody, like the treasurer, the CEO, the president? This amendment would not change that. Uh, whatever the current law is. Um, for example, I think there are some some special identification requirements. Uh, yes, for example, in 17 BSA 2973, if it's a, a electioneering communication on radio, TV, or internet, and the person you pay for well, it's not an individual, the audio statement has to include the name of the title of the treasurer in the case of the PAC. Okay. But this amendment would not change those conditions. Thank you. And when you register your PAC, you have to say who you're treasurer is a list everybody that's in it. No, but they, you do have to list when people donate to the pack. But you don't yeah. Okay. So this would what I like about this is that instead of having to research who the campaign for happy families is, you know up front who is sponsoring the campaign on happy mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. So I, I like this change. And I would move that we accept it. Sorry. Sorry, did I say that? Um, did you say? Well, second. Oh, I'm you. sorry, I realized I said that I didn't want to testify. You said one small point. That. I might want to weigh in on if possible. <laughs> it has been a rough morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll be Go ahead. Going. No, 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 no. It's, no, no. it's yeah. uh, well setting elect director of elections for the record. Betsy Ann mentioned it before. That my suggestion is just to add, if applicable, language oh, yes. to this yes. requirement when it's a group of people, individuals. Yeah. It's pretty rare that we see those packs, but just to allow for it. Because it would be hard to put the the neighborhood of um, Elm Street pack for um, not cutting down trees. <laughs> I was <coughs> just looking at it's it. Not, it isn't an entity that's formed the pack. It's a bunch of people. To that point, I think if you didn't do anything, if you left it alone as Betsy has drafted it now, I would read it as requiring you to list the names of those people. So what if it is just a random group of people? Let's say let's say those of us in this room decided to start a pack. What would we would we not have to identify ourselves at all in the name of the pack because we're just random? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what I'm suggesting, at least. Mm. <laughs> I was gonna say we have not be the Senate come up. Well, I, I, I mean, I think I'm not saying that's bad. I just want to be clear. I think you're right. I don't know how you would if you if it's a group of people that a pack is a group of people that get together. Yeah. To so like the realtors pack is is separate from the realtor association. So do they have to because it's they people donate specifically to. That pack, twenty-five dollars or less. Do do they have to say the Vermont Realty Association pack, even though it's made up? Uh, the pack itself is made up of individuals who donate to that pack. It isn't. It isn't. It would. It would be in my mind is now, as we have, are talking about it, would be the Vermont Realtors Associations. Campaign for clean water, but or whatever. But, but it is individuals that are doing it. How is that different than the individuals on Elm? But they're not individuals because they've they, come together no, as a group. They don't. The individuals donate to that pack. The corporation, the the realty association, does not donate to the pack. The individuals do. Oh, I see what you mean. The, on um, the other hand, it is the group as a group that is sponsoring that. Pack that's called Campaign for Clean Water. Okay. But it may not be all the realtors that belong to the Realty Association. It may be well, 
32 of them as opposed to a membership of 75. Yeah, but so they've agreed the as, a, as, as a group to do it. Who is, who, is, is. who are these people writing their check to, the $25 check? Who are they writing it to? To the PAC. And the PAC has a name. The PAC is. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, if you have, OK, go ahead. I hope, I hope you're not overcomplicating it. You I, are I know. The definition of the connected organization in here right now doesn't relate to who makes contributions right. to the PAC. It relates to, it's defined as, excuse me, um, the, the, all okay. the group of entities that are currently considered PACs, two or more individuals, corporation, labor organization, et cetera, um, that directly or indirectly establishes, administers, or financially supports the political committee. And financial support is then further defined as not contributions to it, Okay. But payment of establishment, administration, and solicitation costs. So the underlying administrative costs. So okay. in your example, it would be the Realtors Association That's providing that set up the PAC and, pay, okay. and administers the PAC. Got it. Um, so so would, regardless of who contributes to it. The, the very limited circumstance I'm talking about is when it's two or more people, yeah. me and you, that set up a PAC. And then I don't know what, what you would call the... There is no um, connected right. organization that you okay. could name. And that's why I was saying, I guess, with, if, if you left it as it is, my advice to those groups would be the name of your connected organization is your names. Sending in white. Go for it again. <laughs> so if we, if we wanted to form uh, Vermonters for Happy Families, we would just call it Vermonters for Happy Families. You would be the treasurer. And I donate to it, so I'm on the list of donees, and you are of donors. And anyone else we can and anyone convince else to we can in. convince that. So you call it sending in the white. No, we wouldn't call it. No, we wouldn't call it that. We would call it the pack for happy families. No, I thought what well, was saying in those circumstances you would use the individuals. But what if it's 32 individuals that come together? Yeah, you know, well, they need to have a group name. Well, they do. Their group name is the Neighborhood to Save not, Elm Street. They're not attached to any existing They're not attached to anything. They're just, they want to save their the trees on their street, or they want to. Why aren't they just then a nonprofit? Why are they a PAC? Because they're, they're not a nonprofit. They're, they just want to support candidates. They're, they're a political action committee. That's what they are. So I, somebody help us out here because yeah. I'm, I'm getting myself I all think I, got, I got it now. I think that Will's correctly and probably Betsy wanted to say the same thing, but even if it's an informal yeah. committee of you and I, if you follow that sentence down, if we establish, administer, or financially support a political committee, that's where it captures being a PAC. If you're not already supporting a political committee, then it would fall under the if applicable part of this, I think. No? We're, Betsy, I think if, if you two were already holding yourself out as, oh, we're the good government group, you might include that in this name. But I think the director of elections was saying to avoid these issues where it's just a couple of individuals getting together, they want to form a pack. Right. On page two, I hope it's your page two, you would just say, a political committee's name shall include the name of its connected organization, if applicable. Yeah. Just in case you're one of those, I think the director described it as the unusual situation where a couple of real individuals are getting together and say, let's form a PAC because yeah. we want to support these types of candidates. Yeah. So if you put the if applicable in there, when the people on Elm Street decide to save the elm trees, they aren't connected to a connected organization. So. That's not applicable then. Great. Okay. Unless they registered a nonprofit and then right. set up the PAC. Yes. Right. But they using they, that right. nonprofit's money. Right. But right. they set up the PAC by meeting at the kitchen table. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. Thank you. I certainly got myself in a knot on that one. Oh no, I did too. I was following your logic. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so do we do we agree that the name of the connected organization should be 
part of the name of the pack. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. we've made a motion and it's been seconded. Okay. So, all in favor of that. Okay. So, now we move on to the third one, which is, well, I, I don't think we have to make any decision on page one on that clarification that allows PACs to, to organize themselves before the $1,000, just to make it clear. I don't think it, I think it was allowed before, but this just makes it clear. Okay. So, on to page four. And this is from, uh, from page, page four of 1.1 or page, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right there. Line um, 68. This would require them to only set up one. I mean, it would prohibit them from setting up more than one. I, I like that idea. I would support that. Mm -hmm. I need some clarification. Yeah, I, I, think I mostly I, like it, but I don't feel it's just something nagging at the back of my brain that says I have a question. I'm not even sure what it is. I'm, well, let me try my question and see if it helps you. I am um, um, Cumberland Farms. Oh no, I take take one that's owned by somebody in Vermont. I'm Coda and Coda. We have a company down there, Coda and Coda. They're fuel distributor, home fuel, home heating fuel. They have their corporate headquarters, and then they have uh, places that they own some gas stations, and some gas stations, are those gas stations a part of CODA and CODA? So they, they couldn't make their own, is that, I, that isn't a very good example, but so you look at the question of subsidiaries, is that what you're trying well, to get at? Or, or um, not even, yeah. Of not subsidiaries. What is it when you own it? When McDonald's? Franchises. Franchises, thank you. Subsidiaries or franchises? Is that what you're well, trying to get at? Well, that would be one. But another one I'm thinking isn't even as, as a. So you have uh, the Archdiocese of Vermont. Is that what the? Burlington. Of uh, Burlington. And then you have Catholic churches underneath that, I believe. You do. So the but arch. they're not incorporated separately. I don't believe that. Um, aren't you all part of, of I mean, I'm not a Catholic. I'm not so a Catholic I'm, either. So, so I'm, are, I'm making I, this up. But I. So, but would that mean, I guess, that the. If the St. Michael's in Brattleboro wanted to form a little pack because they had a particular issue in Brattleboro area, they could not do it if the archdiocese had formed a pack. Is that? Am I right about that here? I think so. I think so. Yeah. What do you? What that's the answer? I I think you're hitting on maybe at least a gray area with what's considered a subsidiary. Yeah, subsidiary and franchises are a good challenge for this. So I base this on federal law, which I provide a link to it there, um, on your page two of your overview. It talks about groups being affiliated, including subsidiaries, corporation. Um, so it does include subsidiaries. Yes. But I think that language is raising these questions is that mm -hmm. should they be considered a separate entity if they could very well have very different reasons for wanting to influence an election than their parent mm -hmm. um, entity. If the federal guidelines to this are as complicated as the federal guidelines on banning corporate contributions I don't think there's any way we can make this clear. I'm not sure I support this section. Just because I don't think we, in my mind it's not clear enough and I'm not sure, I, I don't know. And they, 
a corporation can give to more than one PAC. So you could have corporation X forms a PAC and Y forms a PAC and Z forms a PAC and A. And they're all, they all deal in the same business, whatever it is. And they can all give to each other's PACs. We can't stop that. So, no, we can't. You can't, okay, we can't. We can't. Um, that, because we can't say where, the, what, where people can give their money, except we can say that they can't give it directly to candidates. But we, they can give to any PAC they want. We can't tell them they can't. So I don't know that this, if you want to, one potential solution is to get rid of that language saying that a connected organization includes any organizational parent, subsidiary, branch, division, partner, or local unit. Then what would it do? Um, it would just go back to the original connected organization that started a path that would say they can't, those same people could not form another one. Oh, the, the, the parent organization. But why wouldn't you just say then, oh, oh, I see. Corporation, labor, organization, public interest group, or other entity that directly or indirectly establishes theirs. So you couldn't, the NEA couldn't have two, two PACs, one for um, promoting uh, good classroom behavior and one for, they were going to support candidates who promoted good classroom behavior and one that supported um, lowering property taxes. They could do that. The question is whether they could have, the NEA could have a PAC and then the Wyndham County NEA could have a PAC. Right, but if we take out subsidiary here, then they could. Well, it's subsidiary, branch, division, department, or local unit thereof. Right, well, Betsy's suggesting we take that out which would eliminate that issue. But could they, so they couldn't have more than, they couldn't have more than one pack. The, the NEA itself. Vermont the NEA, NEA that's how I would read that. But if we take that language out, then the Wyndham County one could, if they have a different issue that they just want to have a little to locate, influence their right. local candidates. That's how I would read it, because it's a different entity. Um, definitely think you should talk to Secretary of State's office and AD's office to make sure that it's clear from for their perspective okay. how they administer and execute the okay. What would does anybody want to weigh in on that? On how that would Paul? Um, for the record, Paul Burns of Eber. I I think that what we're trying to what what one might be trying to get at here would be where a single uh, person or group is you know, kind of in control of multiple uh, corporate entities. And, and, it, and I don't have the perfect answer here either, but that's the idea is that you don't, you, you would try to avoid having a single small group being able to say, well, we've maxed out under this one and now we're gonna go to this and to this and to this that they also control. It may be that with the language that you're now considering, the Wyndham County subs uh, subsidiary or whatever the, the, the term is, is is independently enough run that it's really not the same as saying that uh, the NEA out of Montpelier is in control of, of every decision that they make. But I think that's that's kind of what you're trying to get at is, is limiting the influence of that one powerful small group who could otherwise just be uh, controlling multiple entities and giving through each and potentially maximizing their contributions through each. That's what you're, at least I, as I understand it, that would be the intent here is to try to eliminate that uh, type of influence. And uh, I don't know, I, I think it's a fair question, is that are you, would you be accomplishing that with the, with the language that you suggest um, that I think is on the table now? So how can we further clarify it? Has anybody, any other jurisdiction done this? Yeah, I pointed to uh, mm -hmm. federal law mm -hmm. and their affiliated, um, how all affiliated entities, they all count toward the one contribution limit of the parent corporation um, under federal law. That's 
on page two to the top. Uh, Connecticut similarly says a business entity cannot establish more than one political committee. And I just provided a link to their definition of business entity. I don't have my iPad with me. I came down here like I lost my homework or something. And so I can't look it up to tell you what that you want to use by? definition specifically is. You can get the hyperlink on, you have to pull up this doc yeah. on your web page, and then you can access the hyperlink from there. Uh, but if I recall correctly from the Connecticut business entity, I don't think it added that language regarding affiliates or subsidiaries. I think it just goes to the individual business entities itself, but I'd have to confirm by looking at the definition. So I have another question about here. How do you indirectly establish? I get that on page, on line 72, I get that you directly establish or administer, but how do you indirectly? I, I mean, did tell, you tell somebody else to do it? Yeah. Tell. I th that gets a little vague. I mean, I could see that we could say if if I supported this at all, it would have to say something like. Um, a corporation, labor organization, public interest group, or. A, other entity that directly establishes, administers, or establishes or administers a political act, a political committee, action committee, can't do more than one. Because in my mind, that's clear. It, it says that a corporation, a labor, what does it say? Corporation, labor organization, public interest group, or other entity that directly establishes or administers can only do one, but. Yeah. I, I got the uh, directly or indirectly from the federal law definition, but those means you have to stick with it. I'm always, I'm, in terms of campaign finance, I have to tell you, I'm very leery of sticking with any federal law. <laughs> Just having learned what I learned when we were. Oh, thank you. Great, yeah. So where are we, game? Well, I like the theory of it. I'm just uh, unclear about how to be as clean about it as we'd like to be. I, I, I like the idea of limiting how many packs they can create. And, I, and uh, it doesn't bother me that that would limit franchises or subsidiaries. I mean, Anthony, what do you, I mean, this is your, Baby, what are you thinking? The less the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah, I mean, that's generally what I would say. It just, this question of, like, well, when you're talking about subsidiaries, I think of it more as these regional groups. I'm not so sure about limiting them. Maybe I don't feel that strongly, and that's why I'm not being clear about it. Well, do we have any, or Paul or Dan or anybody, do we have any examples of of corporations that we, you know that are on our radar screens of, of an example of the misuse of this? Well, it isn't the law yet. Well, or an example of a corporation. Uh, Creating more than one pack that you know or a group. I mean, do we have examples of anything that's been sort of stuck out or egregious or has bothered, has risen to the top, and been here? Under, under our Vermont system and, and the Vermont registrations, it's pretty rare that a single entity registers more than one pack. Rare, but not impossible. I can't think of an example off the top of my head that gives you an indication of how rare. So if you have, I'm searching through the registrants from the 2018 cycle right now that you can you. search on our website, and I'm not finding any. Uh, but of course, you, they, there is no particular incentive to right. do that now because there isn't a restriction right. on corporate 
giving in the way that would be in place under right. this law. Yeah. So it's not surprising that you wouldn't find that now. There are examples of where uh, individuals have been giving through a number of different corporate entities. Um, your former colleague, Senator Galbraith, used to speak uh, uh, a lot about the idea that people could create an in, uh, innumerable number of LLCs and so forth. And I don't, well, I don't know how many examples, but certainly there are examples that one could find where people have um, given or kind of related corporations have all given uh, to a certain candidate, for instance. But it costs money to set up LLCs. I mean, it's not an insubstantial thing to create LLCs. To, to do an LLC? No. Are you kidding? It's effort, it's time, and it's some money, right? Not but not much. My husband set up his LLP for um, $20 registration fee at the Secretary of State's office. That's what it cost him. So, so this is, I was, I was just mentioning that as a point of fact, excuse me, Senator. Mm -hmm. um, related to the language you guys are looking at right now, I always come to you with the perspective of can I answer questions about it from the people who right. are regulated by it. I don't have an issue with, with that particular list of kinds of subsidiaries that's in there. And my answer to anybody asserting that they weren't one of those would be that it's up to them to make that argument when somebody challenges them on that basis. I think most of them will look at that list and acknowledge that they are one of those things, or it will be clear that they aren't. Yeah. And I think Paul's point is a good one, which is this this will, our limitation in other areas, it's like the balloon. It'll push it into, in, in, it will make this more, possibly more relevant because uh, when you're limited in one capacity, you often try and find ways that you aren't limited, obviously. And this would then be, help keep that a little more consistent without allowing it to pop up in, in greater numbers elsewhere. So I have enough issues with this, this section. I don't have any issues with the other two. I have enough issues with this that what I would say is, what my feeling is, if, if the corporation or the public interest group or the labor organization has to have their name in the pack, they, in the, when this takes effect and we see that Beeper has now set up 23 packs or that ExxonMobil has set up 23 packs, we can revisit it. Good point. That is, you that can always do that. I, I just have enough concerns about it right now that I, don't, I would not feel comfortable um, defending this. That's. Anthony, what do you think? I could go with that. You what? I could go with what you just said. Oh. Me too. Yeah, me too. All right. So we should be able to get um, a clean copy of the original with your um, the First Amendment there about the um, the name. Yes. Yes. Hello, Mr. Pro Tem. Might I chat with you for a moment? The in private name. or just right here? Which oh, you mean? I got here. Oh, that means in private. So, so my, private. So my, can I just one second first? Is we have this? Um, I believe we are dealing with this until three o'clock. Is it possible to have it a clean copy and we can vote on it before three? Well, yes, we'll get him. He's... Would you prefer him straight off format? Uh, whichever is easier. We've heard that in some instances, uh, because of workload, that it's easier to do an amendment. But uh, whatever is easier for you. Okay. Okay. I prefer strike all, but I do. on. On this one, I don't care. Okay. All right. So Just two seconds. Yes. So we'll do that. We'll take a break right now. Okay. For 15 minutes. Sounds good. Really? <laughs> so committee, we. Uh,
Senator Bray wasn't here when we made our decisions. We hopefully he'll agree with our decisions. We had three issues to um, to decide. One was the underlying um, question of whether we should limit contributions to candidates and political parties from only individuals, PACs, and political parties. And we all agreed on that. Then we had the question of should the name of any PAC, the, the founder of the PAC, <laughs> The leader of the pack. I was going to say, there's a good song. Yes. From, 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 from founder of the pack. <laughs> so, should, should the, the uh, organization, the entity that creates the pack, have to embed their name in the pack? And we all agreed with that. And then the third question was um, should we limit the number of packs? that any entity can form. And there, we felt there were so many questions that we couldn't, and what we would do is, since they have to have their names in their packs now anyway, in four years we'll come back and say it's a problem or it's not a problem, we'll deal with it then. That was the, so we now have a clean draft here, draft 1.1, as of 2.35 this afternoon, that um, we can, look at and <coughs> okay. okay Betsy do you want to just tell us what we're voting on all right yeah Betsy and Russ legislative council I structured it as a strike off just to have it all in one place and so you'll see the sections go in chronological order so it's a little backwards from mm -hmm. the main picture but it starts out with that definition of a pack this came from the amendment you just reviewed page one allows someone to start a PAC before they reach current law's $1,000 threshold. Page two, um, starting in line seven and nine, same concept, you can start a PAC before you reach the $1,000 threshold. Starting on page two, line 10, there is the requirement that a PAC's name shall include the full name of its connected organization if applicable, adding in that if applicable. And then it says, or clearly recognized abbreviation or acronym. Um, and Chris, just so that you know that if applicable is there just because in the few instances where you have the neighborhood of Elm right. Street that organizes to save the elm trees, there really isn't any founding. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's not only in its name there, but at the bottom of page two, like you already saw in your amendment, if applicable, when they register, they'd have to include the name of their connected organization or the abbreviation or acronym. Then, you're moving on over to page four. Allison, did you have a question? I do a little bit. I mean, how are they going to know if it's applicable, other than call it well? Uh, there is a definition of connected organization, so they'll know that a connected organization means for more informal committee of two or more okay, people, so that. or labor organization, so they'll have to decide, they'll probably call up the director, say, what's this about? The director will probably say, are you a connected organization? Here's the definition. They'll say, oh, yes so we are. The definition of connected organization is just not in this draft. Obviously. It is, actually, on page four. Ah, we just haven't had it come in. Yeah. So you'll see that where on page four, it starts with line three and subsection D as used in this section with the definition of connected organization. What I removed from this draft is what appeared in your previous amendment, which was that limit on the number of PACs a connected organization could establish. So that is out of this one. It's not in here anymore. It's been removed. So you got rid of that. Now you just have the definition of a connected organization. It's the same thing you looked at before, except I got rid of the language to say, including any organizational parent, subsidiary, branch, division, department, because it didn't seem to matter anymore if you're having the PAC name included in it, and it would allow, would um, hopefully lessen the confusion between the state NEA and the county NEA. Okay. Well, so we'll see if it's a problem. It's called the wait and see. There you go. Um, I did include the directly or indirectly because of some of the conversation, or I kept that in um, about, you know, here an asso Realtors Association says, hey, employee, take this money and go start a PAC um, to address that situation, if that's okay. I can take it out. No, it, 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 could, it can be there. It's going to be a little bit 
hard to, but it's there. You think it's okay? Yeah. Okay. So otherwise, the language about financial aid supports, members of the connected organization um, do not change. Then section three, starting at the bottom of page four and moving on, is the same exact language as the bill was introduced with the prohibition on anybody but an individual PAC or party giving to a candidate or party. So same exact language in the bills introduced, no change there. Bottom of page seven, same effective date. That weird date is just the date of the new election cycle after our 2020 general election. And then the top of page eight, I just changed the title of the bill to read an act relating the persons authorized to make contributions to candidates and political parties. That was the original title, but then also, and a political name, committee names, just since you're addressing that issue as well. So I know the answer to this, but on page six, notwithstanding, that was said notwithstanding. That means we basically were negating what's the, what came before it. That's right, that's saying despite these the the contribution limits above, where it says any single source can give to a candidate or party, only individuals, PACs, and parties can give to a candidate or party. That's what I thought. Yeah. Moody? Are you there? Does somebody want to make a motion? I would make a motion. I would make a motion that we move. S47, S, the sprinkle, S47. <coughs> well, I guess our first motion is to accept the, the amendment. Sprinkle. To, to, to I would move that we accept the sprinkle amendment of S47. Draft 1.1. S47 as amended by draft 1.1.